Well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's really a great honor to have this uh, chance to speak to you. So yeah, so as Henry mentioned, I'm Ryan Eustis and um, I'm now with the Toyota Research Institute um, and on a hybrid leave right now from U, U of M. And uh, I'm really excited to have a chance today to talk with you about uh, our approach uh, to the road to vehicle automation in particular Toyota's Guardian approach, which I think is somewhat unique in the industry and I'm excited to share that with you today. So the outline of my talk is uh, first a little bit about TRI, um, our perspective at large about the current state of automated driving in the in industry, uh, then TRI's approach to automated driving in terms of our dual path approach to chauffeur and guardian, some example core automated driving capabilities that I think are key to unlocking uh, this vision, and then kind of ending on our guardian first uh, strategy. So first a little bit about TRI. Uh, so Toyota Research Institute is Toyota's R&D group tasked with creating Toyota's future capabilities. Um, we were established in January 2016 here in North America um, to improve the quality of human life through advances in artificial intelligence, automated driving, robotics, advanced material design and discovery, as well as machine assisted cognition. And our mission is to amplify human capability, not replace it. Our institute has three sites. So here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, Cambridge, Mass, and then Los Altos, California, that are within close proximity to world-class universities such as U of M to support research that advances TRI's mission. We're about 300 headcount uh, in size, in, which includes our employees and secondees and assignees. Um, as well as we have uh, through Toyota AI Ventures, we support entrepreneurs uh, innovating in autonomous mobility, robotics, uh, data, and cloud space uh, with our uh, Toyota AI Ventures Fund. So now kind of moving beyond the numbers, you know, what TRI is truly focused on is developing human amplification capabilities for Toyota. Now, many of the tech companies are developing technology solutions that seek to replace the role of the human in the automated future. Here at TRI, uh, we recognize that technology that amplifies the human experience is actually truly beloved. Now, a couple examples of thinking about amplifying human capabilities rather than replacing that come to mind. So in the car space, you know, when we think about a car, you know, allows the person to travel faster and further than they ever could on their own. And we also think of it as kind of an amplification, that joy of driving that kind of comes with it. Uh, musical instruments are another example of kind of amplifying um, our creativity uh, as humans. And then, you know, quite literally, you know, a human mobility support system, such as the one that's pictured above, that restores one's ability to walk. This is kind of our concept of amplification of using technology to enhance the human experience. Now, however, we cannot take credit for this uh, concept alone here at TRI. Amplifying instead of replacing human ability is actually an old idea, and there's actually a word for it in Japanese. The word is called jidoka, and what it means is automation with the human touch. And jidoka has been part of Toyota's DNA since we were a loom maker. So if you go back to before we made cars, we actually uh, got our start making weaving looms. And the original innovation that catapulted Toyota to success in the loom business and gave it the capital to develop the vehicles uh, was also in the spirit of Jidoka. The key insight was to develop mechanisms to automatically stop the loom whenever a thread broke. Previously, you know, we the humans would have to uh, very meticulously kind of watch and monitor the loom to see if, if any of the threads would break. And then the key kind of innovation here was to automate that such that, you know, one person now can monitor multiple looms at once because the now the machines no longer require constant supervision. This that kind of idea of blending the best of the human with the machine is this kind of concept of Jadoka. And actually here in the automated driving space, we think about Jadoka as well. What you're seeing here is, a, is one of our test vehicles. This is a guardian equipped vehicle. It's, you can see it going through this closed course. You can see it actually knocking over some cones. That's because we set up a very challenging course at people manually driving it. It's very hard for them to do it well. We've now turned automation on. This is now Guardian blending with the human. And you can see that we asked the participants, you know, just hit the gas, drive through the course as fast as you can, and they can drive through it perfectly. So it's actually assisting and working with the human to kind of make small corrections or the word humans providing the wrong input to actually make you a more enhanced and capable driver. This is some of our vision behind Guardian of blending the best of the human machine, which we'll talk about more in my talk. So first, though, let me talk a little about at large, kind of my, the perspective on the current state of automated driving uh, in the industry. And I like to start off with this quote um, uh, called Amara's Law. We tend to overestimate the effect of the technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. Let's take a look at some of the kind of bold predictions if you go back to kind of the 2016, 2017 era 
uh, in some of the news up headline articles of the day, many of them talked about, you know, the future is now, we're going to be deploying basically automated driving vehicles by 2020. Uh, we're not going to give up, we're going to give up personally owned kind of car ownership. We're all going to be taking robo taxis uh, to work. That was uh, a pretty bold uh, prediction uh, back then. But even back in that sort of time frame, there was some counterpoints in the industry uh, to this, both ourselves here at TRI, as well as even one from our old, our own uh, Ed Olson, another faculty member at U of M, who's now CEO at Main Mobility. And Ed had this uh, nice kind of uh, empirical observation uh, called basically the Moore's Law for self-driving vehicles. So for those of you that may not be familiar with the Moore's Law, Moore's Law is an empirical observation that the number of transistors in a computer doubles about every 18 months. This leads to an exponential rate of growth, and Moore's Law is what allows your you know, cell phone now, uh, smartphone, to run circles around your computer, desktop computer from 2000. Now, if we look at trying to apply Moore's, a similar kind of concept of Moore's Law to self-driving, what Ed did is he looked at, okay, well, if you look at the original kind of DARPA Grand Challenges, the 2004 DARPA Grand Challenge, you know, the best self-driving vehicle at the time was Carnegie Mellon Sandstorm, um, which went about 7.4 miles before it crashed off the course uh, on a 150 mile course. Um, and that's about maybe, let's call it 10 miles uh, per failure. Uh, in 2018, Waymo had reported over 11,000 miles per disengagement. So let's call that about 10 to the four uh, kind of miles per failure. If you plot that on this kind of log-log scale where the x-axis represents miles for disengagement, or excuse me, the y-axis represents uh, miles for disengagement, the x-axis represents time. And now uh, we look at this, we see that there's, uh, just given those two kind of data points, we have uh, basically an, an extrapolation here where the, um, uh, the performance doubling every 16 months, given those kind of two data points, if we extrapolate it out to when would that even even at that very aggressive kind of 16 month doubling rate, when would it still achieve kind of human level performance? Well, we see that it still takes about 16 years to reach the human level's performance, which is up to 2035. Now the human level performance number that Ed's using is 100 million miles between fatalities. This is the kind of aggregate statistic here in the US when we talk about driving across the general population of the people. Um, uh, we can generally drive about 100 million miles between fatalities when we look at an aggregate. Now the aggregate statistic actually includes though uh, drunk, distracted driving. And so if we were actually to exclude drunk and distracted driving from that number, it goes up by yet another factor of 10 to about 1 billion miles between fatalities, which is even further on the future than 2035. So the point of this is that humans are really good drivers uh, for as much progress as we're making in automated driving. And even if we were to uh, maintain say a doubling rate of every kind of 16 months in our miles for disengagement, it's still a long horizon ahead before we're able to get at or exceed kind of human level performance under all general conditions. So uh, this is uh, following up on that point. This is uh, something called the hype cycle for emerging technologies. And it was uh, created by Gartner, which is one of the world's leading research and advisory companies. And they've identified that there's five phases that every emerging technology will experience in this life cycle. So the first phase is what's called the innovation trigger. And so if we look at the you know, really the history of automated driving technology, we see that really, I think the modern kind of inter innovation trigger occurred in the years leading up to 2017. Most of this was sparked by DARPA, which is the US Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. And they're responsible for the development of emerging technologies for use by the military. DARPA had commissioned several challenges in the early part of the century to advance automated driving technology. So there was the 2004, 2005, and the 2007 uh, DARPA Urban Challenge, which is one that I personally participated in. If you look into the peak of explanation uh, expectations, this is kind of like one of the next uh, features on this uh, emerging hype cycle graph. Um, so 2017 was probably the peak of hype as evidenced by the proclamation by companies working in the space and media coverage that resulted. There you can see just some of the news uh, kind of article headlines from the day, but all of them kind of proclaiming that automated driving is here and now. Um, but then just a year later, if you look at it, uh, what happened? Because we started to kind of really slide now into the trough of disillusionment. So in 2018, um, I think you know, more companies began to realize the difficulty of the challenge ahead. Uh, and then was a level setting of expectations, but something that our CEO, Gil Pratt here at TRI and I have been saying for many years uh, and really talking about the, the, the practical kind of challenges of doing automated driving at scale. Now in 2019, uh, I think reality continued to set in. And it's hard to know if in 2020 we reached the bottom of the trough or not. Um, 
and that we might be you know, slipping back up uh, with some of the recent announcements about expanded deployments and, and more kind of public road testing that's happening now with getting actual consumers in the vehicle. But it's still maybe years or even decades before we reach what's called a plateau of productivity. Why? Well, why is it so hard? So there's all the kind of myriad of, of adoption challenges that are present, you know, ranging from the technological, the economic, the employment, ethical, legal, security, energy, and the environment. But there's still so many kind of technical, fundamental technical challenges that remain um, in getting this uh, vehicle capability to the level of reliability that it needs to be. You know, the human factors and kind of the social ballet of driving. So when you think about like left turns and traffic across Boston, you know, this kind of social cues that we give each other, that's some of the grease that makes, you know, uh, the social ballet of driving work. You know, road services uh, can get easily paved uh, or changed overnight, which then makes maintaining maps uh, onerous and kind of hard to update. You know, interacting with people. So here's a depiction of, you know, this is a, a green stoplight. When, when does a green stoplight not mean go? Well, it means, it means stop the moment that there's a cop standing there doing this with their hand up. That kind of contextual reasoning is really, really hard. Um, it's not that we want to have our self-driving vehicles stop for any teenager that's just going to do this on the side of the road. It's all that kind of top-down reasoning about understanding, seeing that the police officer's uniform, understanding uh, you can see the police cruiser maybe with the, the lights parked, uh, the lights flashing, as well as recognize that maybe just the baseball game got out and they're trying to manage traffic flow. That level of kind of top-down reasoning is still kind of very far out there into, from an AI perspective. Uh, and then, you know, being here from a, a northern uh, uh, northern climate like Michigan, you know, this aspect of all weather driving and being able to kind of drive um, uh, when you can't even see the road because it's snow covered, as well as better sensors. So this informs somewhat our approach then to automated driving. So let me tell you a little bit about TRI's approach in terms of chauffeur and guardian. And before I get into launch into TRI's approach, I really wanted to share this kind of brief clip of Toyota's automated driving technology from the 30 plus years that we've actually been working in this space. So believe it or not, Toyota's automated driving research and development actually started in 1990. Uh, the original intent of the research was to reduce traffic accidents and improve uh, advanced active safety technology, which you'll see later in this presentation is still part of our DNA and strategy today. And while much of the technology here was analog and calculated manually, Toyota nonetheless forged through these early years and saw the potential advanced technology could bring to safety. So here at TRI, you know, we started in 2016. And so we quickly went through a, a rapid series of generations of platforms, starting with our platform one vehicle. Our platform two was the first vehicle where we introduced this idea of a dual cockpit, which I'll talk a little bit later with our platform three and then our latest generation of vehicle, which is our platform four, uh, that is currently the workhorse of the fleet. Now, when it comes to testing automated driving and kind of verification, I like to think of testing automated uh, vehicles as a pyramid. So at the base is what we refer to as virtual testing, which is then followed by closed course and then public road testing. So every time we update our code, uh, the entire system is first run through simulation a series of tests at an engineer's desk and in the cloud, emulating how a car will respond on the road to ensure that nothing is regressed during a code change. This is kind of our virtual testing battery that we run all of our software through. So it ranges from things like uh, isolated kind of motion and planning control tests where we can generate um, kind of difficult scenarios for the vehicle in the simulation, something that'd be very hard to recreate in the real world uh, safely. Uh, we have things like sensor sim where we can now actually like spoof the actual sensor feeds and kind of test the full uh, driving stack um, and like driving in the matrix. And then we also have log replay. So kind of log events that we've captured from the real world fleet we can now reprocess these uh, scenarios, both uh, using um, kind of hardware in the loop uh, emulation. Now, once everything operates correctly, uh, we then proceed on to testing on closed courses and ultimately public roads. So with the closed course testing, uh, we tested our proprietary facility that we developed here in Michigan. This is our Toyota Ottawa Lake facility. Um, it's right on the border between Michigan and Ohio, basically the last exit off US 23 South. Um, and so you can see a depiction of, uh, of our full facility, which is purpose built for automated driving, uh, including things like this uh, um, aggressive kind of high dynamics pad that is off in the left hand side of the video, that kind of darker color gray. Um, we also have agreements with M City as well as the American Center for Mobility here in Michigan. And then out in California, we also have agreements with GoMinum Station. And so we do um, a lot of closed course testing across these sites. Finally, then we have public road testing. And the purpose of public road testing is there to test our assumptions and really to find the unknown unknowns. It's a rich source of data 
that then seeds kind of like new simulation test cases. And this is kind of virtuous cycle then of the virtual to close course to the public road kind of testing battery that we have. So we have vehicles on public road, both here in Michigan, as well as in California, as well as uh, driving in uh, Tokyo uh, in Japan. And with our Boston office, we use vehicles for manual data collects. So at TRI, our focus is on creating one system that can operate in two distinct modes. And we have what we call the guardian mode and the chauffeur mode. So chauffeur is the kind of self-driving technology that we hear about most in the press. And specifically, it's an approach that replaces the human driver with the machine. You know, chauffeur essentially removes the human from the driving equation, either completely in all environments or within a restricted operational design domain, such as like a geofence kind of robo taxi service. Uh, this is a wonderful goal and someday we may achieve it um, at large, but it's essential not to as, as underestimate just how hard a task chauffeur systems are, both technologically and sociologically. Now, leveraging this exact same system and underlying technology and software, we're developing what we call the guardian mode, which is meant to amplify human control of the vehicle, not replace it. Think of this as the ultimate version of Toyota Safety Sense. With Toyota Guardian, the driver is meant to be in control of the car at all times, except in those cases where the Toyota Guardian anticipates or identifies a pending incident and employs a corrective response in coordination with the driver's input. The eventual goal here is to create a car that is incapable of causing a crash. And each step uh, in development focuses on enabling these two modes of operation, chauffeur and guardian, so that we're building one single unified kind of technology stack overall. So guardian chauffeur uh, in our minds is really the convergence of active safety and automated driving. By developing a unified technology stack to address both guardian and chauffeur, a majority of the code between the two applications um, is shared between perception, prediction, and planning. So let me first tell you a little bit more about the, the chauffeur application uh, and some of our work there. So we're working on two vehicles that integrate L4 automated driving. Uh, the first is TRI's automated driving test vehicle, the P4, which I introduced earlier. Uh, and we're using it to explore L4 and Moz uh, like applications, Moz being mobility as a service. Uh, the second is Toyota's LQ concept vehicle, uh, shown there to the upper uh, left which uh, this vehicle leverages advanced technology to build an emotional bond uh, between the car and the driver. And it features TRI's automated driving technology as the foundation of, of the technology stack. Now, some of our uh, testing uh, takes place in Japan. And so we are seeing here is uh, some, uh, a replay of basically of uh, a visualization of our vehicle driving in uh, the Odaiba district of Toyota, which is uh, an often congested kind of waterfront subsetter. So Odaiba's cloud, complex environment of pedestrians, vehicle traffic, diverse road infrastructure, and tall glass buildings. It provides a challenging setting in which to research and develop the capabilities of Toyota's automated driving technology. So you can see this is our vehicle operating in an L4 uh, kind of configuration where the human strictly is a passenger. Now at the same time, we're trying to use that same baseline of technology in what we call Toyota Guardian, which is to not replace the human, but to amplify the human. How do we use AI to guard the human? So uh, with Toyota Guardian, uh, we're really doubling down on human driving. Guardian is designed to correct for human mistakes and human weaknesses and assisting the most vulnerable people at both end, ends of the age spectrum where far too many lives are lost. We think that the Guardian approach presents a more immediate opportunity to deploy automated vehicle technology at scale in an active safety application to save as many lives as possible as soon as possible. We believe that in the future, Toyota Guardian will not only save lives, but make driving more joyful than ever like that slalom video I showed you in the intro of my talk, we can actually enhance uh, your driving performance uh, as a driver and, and level you up to have professional skills. So regardless of your driving skill, the Guardian system can enhance your driving performance while keeping you safe. And in fact, we believe so strongly in Guardian that Toyota's announced Guardian for All and is planning to offer to the industry so the benefits can extend beyond just Toyota and Lexus vehicles, but to the entire industry. Now, key to this approach of, of the Guardian mindset is what we call blended envelope control which is a holistic control scheme that keeps a uh, given physical system inside a safe operating regime. We commonly think about this technology say in like a modern fighter jet or with an aircraft where the pilot controls the stick. When they fly the stick, they're not actually um, flying the control services directly, but they're working with a low level flight control system to keep the airplane within a dynamically safe operating regime. It's the same concept we're trying to do for cars although it's a much more complex uh, uh, application because it's not just the vehicle dynamics we have to deal with, um, but we also deal with understanding the road topology, understanding the other uh, agents, you know, other road users in terms of pedestrians and the drivers and what our uh, predicted interactions gonna be with them. 
Now, uh, part of testing this kind of a garden concept, we've created what looks like a very sci-fi kind of looking vehicle, uh, which is this uh, dual steering wheel, uh, or we call it dual cockpit test vehicle. Now, you might be scratching your head and being like, wait, I thought this was going to be a self-driving car talk. I thought you guys were trying to get rid of steering wheels. Why are you adding steering wheels to cars? Well, let me explain a little bit what's going on here. So in the depiction you see on the left, that would be the standard kind of stock steering wheel um, that's associated with the vehicle. Here we can put one of our trained safety drivers behind the wheel. And so as while we're developing Guardian, uh, the human safety driver can actually provide a mechanism to kind of take over um, when we're doing some of our testing. Now on the right, which is typically the passenger seat, uh, we have a replicated set of controls in terms of steering, brake, and accelerator. And what's unique about these uh, replicated controls is that they are all steer by wire. One of the main things that we're kind of working on is how do we actually seamlessly blend the control input of the human uh, with the AI and kind of change that coupling dynamically in software uh, via these steer by wire mechanisms and, and brake by wire and accelerate by wire mechanisms. So here's a visual depiction of how kind of blended envelope control works. The vehicle is sensing the road geometry, so it understands where it is. It's sensing the objects live uh, uh, on the road, and so it's kind of computing this kind of green carpet or corridor. We've asked the driver to purposely try to leave and kind of you know crash into those objects. You can see the vehicle is not letting them. As they reach the boundary of basically this kind of computed green feasible uh, safe region, the vehicle and the AI kind of works with the human to blend their control input with what the human's input is they're giving to keep the vehicle within a safe operating machine. Here's how you can see this in an active safety application. So this is what we call a pop-out event. It represents somebody kind of pulling out maybe out of a blind driveway right into your space. The driver doesn't have time to react or step on the brakes and the vehicle actually has to make a large lateral maneuver to avoid the crash. Because this is steer by wire, we don't need to rip the steering wheel out of the person's hands. The vehicle can, can, can change dynamically in software, that coupling between the front steering wheel angles and the, and the steering wheel itself, uh, so that the driver doesn't feel the steering wheel kind of be ripped out of their hands. It's able to kind of make that large lateral maneuver while also coming for other objects in the environment, like these barrels that we place there, to compute a safe path and then kind of seamlessly blend and hand back control uh, to the driver. Now, uh, what we're also exploring in the space of kind of human application is going um, uh, is also how do we have uh, controllability at the very extreme limits of vehicle control. So in this research, we're trying to learn from and infuse the skills of a professional driver to amplify the capabilities of all drivers. So in this work, we're using a modified uh, Toyota Supra to do automated drift driving. And while most people would associate drift driving with the Fast and the Furious, our goal with uh, autonomous drifting Toyota Supra is actually to improve safety. Here's, let me show you how. So this plot that you're seeing here, um, this is called a phase, uh, a phase plot, where on the y-axis, we have basically the yaw rate of the vehicle. So how quickly is the vehicle kind of rotating? And then side slope is on the x-axis, basically how much uh, is the vehicle kind of uh, sliding sideways uh, during its maneuver. That tiny little kind of green box that you see highlighted in the center of that plot, that's the norm, that's the typical region that we think about stable vehicle dynamics, where the vehicle's in a stable configuration and we're trying to apply control, modern control methods uh, with the vehicle. Most current uh, advanced driver assistance systems would operate with just in that kind of green box regime. Now, the big kind of red polygon that you see there uh, surrounding that plot, this is actually uh, the region of what we would call unstable vehicle dynamics, but controllable. This is where basically our professional drift drivers operate. When they are kind of skidding and sliding along the track, they're actually um, controlling the vehicle in this kind of unstable configuration, but it's in, in a controlled way. And so what you're seeing here is that with the Toyota kind of super drift vehicle, we're actually trying to um, harness and master some of our controllability at these extreme vehicle dynamics kind of regimes. So you can see both like the, the blue kind of uh, plots that are there, as well as like some of the magenta plots. Those are coming from our actual experiments where we're showing automated kind of drifting and kind of controllability of that vehicle within those extreme vehicle dynamics. Uh, why are we trying to do this? Well, it's not because we're trying to say um, we, uh, our only purpose of this is to allow a driver to kind of drift. Actually, this is a proxy problem for thinking about say, what does it mean to control the vehicle on icy winter roads? How can we help uh, the normal kind of average driver to maintain controllability and recoverability, even when the vehicle is under some kind of extreme dynamics maneuvers? How can we quickly recover the vehicle to keep it safe? So next, uh, let me talk a little bit then about our work in realizing this guardian vision. And to do that, we need to build a flexible automated driving stack and support both aims of guardian and chauffeur. 
Now, I, so these are uh, what I like to think of as kind of like some of the six core capabilities uh, that we're trying to develop as part of our strategy uh, for guardian chauffeur. Starting with the upper left, we have what I call a dialable system. So I really want a system that can scale, say, from the Yaris to the Lexus. Uh, to uh, uh, what we call the e-pallet, which I'll, I'll introduce later as being a uh, uh, more of a Maz specific like vehicle. So with these uh, dialable systems, uh, we really want to be able to uh, flexible kind of technology stack that can have with or without LIDAR, uh, with or without maps, which then leads me to the idea of observed maps. We really want to think about maps as a sensor. I really want some baseline capability with Guardian to don't leave the road, don't hit things, don't get hit. Uh, and I can't assume that I'm going to have an HD map everywhere. So I want to be able to understand and kind of parts the world live. If I have access to an HD map, that's great. I want to use it, but I don't want to have a fundamental reliance on one. Uh, we also think about human machine interaction and amplification. Um, and so, you know, thinking about having sensors in the cabin, say, tracking basically driver eye gaze, correlating that with what the car sees and senses externally. So that we're kind of uh, uh, aware of what we think the driver is paying attention to and what they're not paying attention to. I coined this uh, a cognitive heat map. We then want to use this with our prediction and planning under uncertainty. Um, so basically trying to estimate both the ego drivers, uh, future intent and actions, and incorporating that um, where we're making uh, our decision-making under kind of probabilistic frameworks, uh, accounting for the uncertainty we may have and, and the, those predictions in the world model. We really want this to work everywhere. So we want a self-aware kind of performance continuum. And that's one of the things that is, I think a strength of the Guardian application is because the human is the primary driver. And the Guardian gets the luxury of introspection. So it gets to basically see how well my predictions matching the world model. How well do I understand uh, the road geometry? Do I think I can do better than the human? Yes, and if so, how can I help to prevent the impending crash? And then also finally with fleet learning. So as we think about you know, the driving preferences, driving in Rome is very different than driving in Boston, is very different than driving in Ann Arbor. One of the ways that we're going to be able to basically accommodate those kind of regional differences in driving is going to come through, through fleet learning and kind of learning from the data uh, in those fields. Now, some of the kind of highlights I'd like to show here um, toward uh, this, uh, these goals. One is our scalable mapping framework. So at TRI, we have this idea of a, of a scalable, kind of globally scalable mapping framework where we really have been working on a, a unified kind of system that can either, it's very flexible. It either can take LIDAR uh, input to build maps, it can take camera input, or it can use a combination of both. Um, what you're seeing uh, depicted here in these videos on the lower left is a high definition map produced completely just from driving through the environment using cameras only. Um, so this is a, a, an equivalent kind of HD map that you might find. Usually today, these maps are made with survey grade vehicles that have very high end um, inertial measurement units and uh, kind of LIDAR. Here we're working on fundamentally trying to uh, make this technology scalable and flexible and, and really trying to see what we can do with cameras alone and just wheel odometry. The video on the right now shows our vehicle localized in the same map, again, just using camera alone. In this case, we've overlaid a, a, a dense kind of 3D point cloud on top of the visualization to help you interpret and kind of see just the accuracy of the registration of our vehicle using, again, camera alone to localize into a camera drive map. Uh, next, uh, we're heavily investing in uh, our machine learning kind of model lifecycle and producing many different models that we use in the car, ranging from perception, prediction, to planning. So uh, this uh, slide depicts basically our unified ML model lifecycle, which we call Ouroboros. So Ouroboros serves as a unified platform to create, train, and deliver all the following ML models into our vehicle. I don't have time to kind of talk to each of the one of these, but let me just focus on one, which is the monocular um, depth estimation. So the goal of this project asks, can we use cameras as inexpensive sensors for depth estimation to replace the 3D point cloud information normally derived from LIDAR? Now, the reason we want to do this is because we're interested in dialable and scalable perception frameworks that can scale from the Yaris, where it's vision only and maybe no LIDAR may be present, to the Lexus there in the middle, which maybe can afford a single forward-looking LIDAR, to the e-pallet there on the right, which is a vehicle purpose-built for Moz and has 360 LIDAR coverage all around. So with this self-supervised approach uh, to molecular depth, uh, depth estimation, allows us to sidestep the need for direct human supervised data labeling and train a network that can accurately estimate depth from a single image. What you can see depicted on the video um, is uh, from four looking cameras captured from one of our test vehicles. So the image in the upper left of the video, that's the raw data from the camera. Below it is the 3D depth map estimated from a single frame alone. And on the right, is a colorized 3D point cloud with the image texture overlaid. 
you can see the remarkable quality of detail in the 3D geometry and the strong preservation of coherence across object boundaries. So this approach naturally, um, accurately matches the results of LIDAR up to about 60 meters, and it makes a strong advance towards the dialable perception framework that can scale from the Yaris to the ETHAL. Finally, uh, this look, all this information kind of feeds up to our motion planning uh, and control framework. So this is where prediction and planning take place. So here's some of the things that we're working on are, are things like risk-aware decision-making, how are we kind of accounting for the different interactions between our vehicle uh, and the other agents. Here we're doing multi-hypothesis kind of scene prediction, looking at different kind of rollouts of what we think the other agents might be doing uh, based on their observed actions. And this allows us to kind of then model some of the complex interactions between our vehicle and the other agents. So on the lower left, you see a learn based park car classifier. In the upper right, you see dense uh, uh, traffic maneuvering. And on the lower right, you see interacting with pedestrians at a crosswalk. So, in conclusion, um, humans can drive today where autonomy cannot. And I think this is one of the kind of key things that motivates us when we think about this dual path approach of our strategy of guardian and chauffeur. This is why uh, our, it really informs us in trying to develop a unified technology stack that can support both guardian and chauffeur. And we really want to view this through the lens of convergence of active safety and automated driving. So for all the reasons I just outlined, uh, TRI is pursuing a guardian-first strategy. At TRI, we believe that the guardian approach may enable uh, deployment of automated vehicle technology much sooner at scale by using it as an active safety system to save as many lives as possible from traffic crashes. The reason for this is that Guardian can operate on a spectrum and develop capability over time, unlike the chauffeur approach where the technology has to be um, near perfect and operate at a very high level of confidence 100% of the time. Guardian can be dialed to only deploy at certain confidence thresholds when it understands the situation, predicts the likelihood of a crash, and is really confident that it knows it can do better than a human uh, in that particular scenario. Now, our recent developments on the L4 MOS can show for applications with our chauffeur program. It continues to make forward progress on Guardian due to the unified technology stack that we have between both Guardian and Chauffeur, um, which then really bolsters our deployment in this Guardian first strategy. And so with that, um, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to now uh, take any questions you might have. Ryan, this is a, a very impressive talk. I'm, I'm really happy to see uh, Toyota's uh, two-mode approach and uh, um, the, the, the Guardian and Chauffeur approach, that's very interesting. Um, maybe you can uh, illustrate a little bit further on this, why are you pursuing this two-mode uh, two approach and how this will, uh, will help Toyota in terms of bringing this to the market? And do you, um, do you have two separate, uh, you know, two separate product team to develop these? And, and, and so, so a little bit more further, I think this is a very interesting and very um, uh, impressive uh, approach. Yeah, thank you, Henry. Um, yeah, I guess on the approach, so uh, to, your, to the last comment you made, uh, it's not actually two separate product teams. Uh, it's one kind of team that's working uh, across both those applications with the unified technology stack. So we're trying to, as much as we can, uh, share as much commonality between perception mm -hmm. and planning uh, between these two applications. Now, some of the reason that I think uh, we're so bullish um, on this kind of dual path approach is that when we look at vehicle automation, I think in my talk, I tried to highlight, you know, maybe a lot of the technical challenges uh, that remain with automated driving. But um, those uh, it shouldn't be underestimated, though, though, just the number of kind of social, sociological challenges that remain with actually introducing automated driving. So let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, today in the U.S., you know, we talk about something like 35, 40,000 kind of fatalities annually per year that happen. Um, and that's an aggregate across all, all human driving. Suppose that we had, you know, we launched tomorrow uh, and everybody had an automated driving system that was going to say 10x better uh, than mm -hmm. human. So let's imagine now uh, we take that 40,000 number and we reduce it to 4,000 uh, deaths annually. As society, as humans, are we going to be willing to accept 4,000 deaths from machines? And I, that's a question I have. I actually don't know the answer because I think humans, we hold a higher bar to machines than we do to other humans. With other humans, we have empathy. We can relate and we can put ourselves in those situations. With machines, I, I, I don't think that's the case. So I think there's some sociological challenges with kind of adopting the technology, but still more we're going back to the technology. There's a lot of challenges that remain, I think. Um, you know, where we see automated driving in a true kind of level four applications take root are typically in a mobility as a service, which is like a geofence kind of robo taxi region. 
you know a heck of a lot there because it's a geofence region. You can map it in advance. You actually know the route, you know the pickup and the destination. So you actually know a lot of information in advance to say, can I send the robo driver uh, to serve this route or could I send basically a human driven taxi? So mm -hmm. it's a more smooth kind of gentle technology slope to begin the deployment. Uh, the other is kind of like long haul trucking. And then there's like, you know, package delivery like companies like Neural. Um, so I think those make sense. And those are the right kind of gentle technology slopes for first deployment. But I think when everybody thinks about automated driving, you know, everybody wants to know when's my car going to drive, right? The car that I own, um, and that, that's just not how this the uh, where the technology is getting a foothold. You know, some of the amount of compute and the sensing that we have to put on these cars, it's a lot of uh, uh, I would call a lot of kit. You know, a lot of uh, kind of uh, um, uh, uh, dollars that we have to put on the vehicles uh, just to just to have enough of the uh, kind of sensing awareness to provide some of these technologies. So these are cars you're not going to own initially. Uh, these are cars that like like a robo taxi, you know, like a robo uh, loop, uh, Uber or Lyft, uh, the economics can maybe work out there, but that's gonna be a slow kind of gradual expansion of the technology. What we really wanna do at Toyota is uh, think about how can we save as many lives as possible at scale? And this is where we're really thinking about more of this active safety mindset with Guardian. And so we're really trying to address, you know, how do I have more of a dialable flexible system so I can really turn the LiDAR knob down, have more of a camera radar based approach so that I get a price point that's more economically feasible for a person on vehicle. How do I relax the map assumptions? But we really think that, you know, out of those uh, 40,000 fatalities per year, it's really through not replacing the human, but if I think about assisting the human, making you superhuman, we can make a huge dent, we think, um, in, in making uh, cars just much more safer um, through, and deploy them at scale uh, more quickly with this Guardian First strategy than full automation. That's a very interesting point as, you know, psychologically, if, you know, if you can augment my ability 10 times and, and then reduce my chance to get into any crash by 10 times, I would buy that car, right? So instead of waiting, waiting for another 10, 15 years um, to, uh, to buy an automated uh, vehicle. Yeah. That's, a, that's, that's very good. Um, so in your talk, you also addressed uh, some of the challenges facing out, um, autonomous adoption. You know, it's, it's uh, for example, this uh, um, techno technology, technical uh, challenges and also social challenges. What, what do you see the biggest hurdle on these? Um, uh, you know, even this is, uh, you know, maybe 15 years out, but uh, what do you see the, the, the biggest challenges to us right now? Yeah, I think uh, one of the biggest challenges I would say on the technology side is gonna be prediction. And really it's because it's, uh, it's predicting human behavior and humans are not necessarily always rational uh, actors and what, and what our similar decisions are. So, um, yeah, I guess in, in terms of having worked in automated driving now for like about 15 years, uh, going back even to like the say DARPA 2007 challenge, mm -hmm. you know, we've made a tremendous amount of progress. You know, if I go back to like 2007 uh, when the DARPA Urban Challenge, this is when some of the first kind of uh, Velodyne HCL64 kind of spinning LIDAR started to, to be developed. Um, you know, some of the results that we have today now from applying AI to computer vision, where mm -hmm. we can take an image and we can basically semantically classify all the objects in the image. If you would have showed me some of our results that we have today, back in 2007, I would have said, no way, it can't be that good. You must be drawing this in Microsoft Paint. That can't be that accurate, but it is now. It's like, we're making huge advances, I would say, in being able to understand our objects and kind of reasoning about objects semantically in images. I think the big challenge is, is still, um, that is um, requires another kind of big breakthrough in AI. It's gonna be on the prediction piece of it. So the example I gave of the cop standing um, at a green stoplight doing this. Mm -hmm. That is a super hard AI problem from a top-down perspective to basically, you don't want to stop for uh, any teenager that's on the side of the road doing this. You know, it's not beyond our capability to write a computer vision algorithm that can recognize a human in this pose, but it's all that kind of contextual awareness of like under recognizing the uniform, seeing the police cruiser that's parked on the side of the road, the lights flashing, recognizing that the baseball game just got out, maybe at Tiger Stadium, they're trying to manage the crowd flow, all that kind of contextual reasoning. Um, you know, Andrew Ng, uh, who's a pretty um, uh, famous uh, uh, AI professor from Stanford, has said that, you know, you know, we're really good today at what I call narrow uh, general intelligence or narrow intelligence, which is kind of like the pattern recognition stuff that we're doing today with AI. But we're still uh, very far away from, you know, generalized intelligence and that, you know, we're as close to generalized intelligence as we are to basically having to worry about overpopulation on Mars. Like it's just another big breakthrough needs kind of happen in the community to get at some of those uh, sorts of problems. So 
I think that's part of some of the long tail uh, that we have uh, when it comes to the technology side of things is prediction. Yeah, yeah. I I I just recently uh, read an article uh, from uh, IEEE Spectrum, um, which they interviewed. I think Michael Jordan from UC Berkeley oh, yeah. on AI, and he was talking about uh, stop uh, calling this AI. This is not AI. It is uh, this is uh, we are very uh, um, AI right now is still lack of uh, cognitive uh, abilities yeah. uh, in terms of you know. Uh, um, knowing exactly, synthesize things together, knowing exactly what it is. And uh, so, yeah, that's, um, and it's, it's, I think it's some breakthrough on that is still needed uh, for autonomous driving, uh, particularly from the vehicle centric uh, approach uh, yeah. uh, perspective. Um, you, you sort of touch upon that uh, you've been working on automated driving for probably more than 15 years. Um, and uh, um, can you talk a little bit, uh, since I know there's a, quite a bit of student uh, joining us as well uh, in the symposium, what, uh, what will keep you uh, for another 15 years? What will motivate you? Oh, good question. Um, and actually, maybe I'll answer that by saying that um, even though I work in automated driving today, that's not where I started. Uh, I actually started working <laughs> in underwater robotics uh, back when I was a student and when I went to school. And it's, it was really just being, uh, you know, finding a problem that you're passionate and, and really being interested in. So I got my uh, start uh, in underwater robotics uh, and actually wanting to work um, in this area called simultaneous localization and mapping. Mm -hmm. So um, underwater is one of those environments where, you know, I think we take for granted today because we all have cell phones, we have access to GPS, you know, we think that position is a solved problem. Well, underwater, you know, those radio signals that GPS relies upon, water is opaque to them. And so we don't have GPS underwater. And so it's like one of these kind of like uh, great uh, application domains for this problem called SLAM, simultaneous localization mapping, which is, you know, how can a robot navigate like a human in the sense that it uses its raw sensor data, either from cameras or LIDARs or sonars to kind of build a map and at the same time use that map to navigate. Well, it turns out that a lot of that same technology um, is actually used by the self-driving car industry. So basically when I joined Michigan's faculty in 2006, this is when I, the DARPA Grand Challenge series events were happening. And I got kind of teamed up with uh, Ford Motor Company at the time working with their team on this. Um, but really the math was the same, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, for me, it's really about, I guess, uh, being what keeps me excited uh, is, you know, working with a bunch of kind of brilliant other people that are all really passionate, um, but not humble uh, and down to earth, but really, you know, we want to make a difference, want to make a dent in the earth. And I think this automated driving uh, problem, it's, it's not a problem that's going to be solved in 15 years time. I mean, I guess we're going to start to see larger and larger kind of application deployments of say geofence like robo taxis we're going to start to see it in like the guardian kind of assisting amplifying the human but when will we truly have say what is considered like a level five personally owned vehicle a vehicle can drive anywhere anytime under any kind of weather conditions i don't know if i'll see that in my lifetime uh, maybe uh, but i think that is just a very tall order to kind of get to that level of capability mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very interesting and, and um, different. Everybody has different stories in terms of how they get into their profession, and uh, and, and yours is a very interesting story as well. And attending the DARPA challenge is probably one of the, um, you know, early motivations for you as well. I, I think that's. Um, I think to the students is also very interesting. Maybe I have one, one more. Uh, this is probably more uh, uh, personal type of uh, uh, questions. And uh, I recently started to work on this USDOT uh, uh, a grant on, um, on the smart intersections. And uh, mm -hmm. so this is really related to my own. Uh, and I, I think the question is probably more generic as well. Um, how do you see that the infrastructure can help in terms of automated driving? Oh, it can help tremendously. Yeah, I think they're very complementary. Um, and in fact, you know, the some of our testing uh, that we do in Tokyo in the Odaiba district, uh, they actually have a, um, a pretty uniform deployment of V to I kind of technology there with some of their intersections. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, each of the traffic that's are broadcasting the phase. Um, and so uh, while at the same time, we're trying to detect, you know, the traffic light signal optically with cameras in terms of the green, yellow, red, we're actually mm -hmm. getting uh, a redundant kind of signal coming from the VDI capability. So I think um, the, the two approaches are very complementary and you putting them together, I think is what makes, is a kind of practical approach uh, to solving. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our focus um, in, within the team that I lead has been on trying to make the car itself intelligent in terms of using sensors, uh, both try to comprehend a world model and then act in it. 
But I think to the extent that we can also have infrastructure that provides a, a supporting role is an enabling technology. And so I think where we can deploy and use it, we should. Great, great. Thank you. I had, uh, uh, maybe one time I'll buy, buy you a beer and see how, uh, how I can help you on that from infrastructure perspective. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Ryan. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.